Imagine your blood sugar numbers staying normal, your weight barely moving, yet one specific type of fat in your body quietly losing its grip. When insulin resistance starts to reverse, visceral fat, the deep fat wrapped around your organs is the first tissue affected because it depends heavily on high insulin to survive. As insulin demand drops, that fat no longer gets first priority for storage and signaling, even though nothing obvious changes on the outside. Instead of dramatic weight loss, the earliest shifts are internal. Smoother energy after meals, less pressure in the abdomen, and appetite signals that feel more proportional. These changes are easy to dismiss, but biologically, they mark the point where visceral fat stops being protected and insulin resistance actually begins to unwind. When insulin resistance builds, visceral fat isn't just along for the ride, it quietly benefits from it. Chronically high insulin creates a metabolic environment where this deep abdominal fat is protected, well-fed, and hard to access. Clinically, this pattern is tied to insulin resistance and the slow progression toward metabolic disease. You experience it as stubborn belly pressure, unstable energy, cravings, and lab numbers that drift despite your efforts. So when insulin resistance finally starts to reverse, what happens to visceral fat first isn't dramatic, but it's decisive, and it sets the stage for everything that follows. When insulin resistance starts to reverse, it rarely looks like a dramatic comeback scene. It looks like a bill quietly shrinking while you're busy living your life. Visceral fat, the deep fat packed around your organs, is often the loudest line item because it doesn't just weigh something. It sends signals that nudge blood sugar, appetite, and inflammation. For a long time, your pancreas has been paying a hidden surcharge by making extra insulin just to keep glucose looking normal. And visceral fat loves that arrangement because high insulin is basically reserved parking for storage. Meanwhile, millions of people walk around thinking they're fine because the number can look okay while the effort behind the scenes is getting expensive. When the effort finally starts easing, less liquid sugar, fewer snack loops, more movement, better sleep, the rules change first and your mirror is the last to get the memo, which is frustrating but also incredibly hopeful. In the first week, the headline is calmer metabolism, not instant weight loss. Under the hood, fewer sugary drinks and fewer snack cycles mean fewer glucose spikes, so insulin gets more hours off the clock between meals. Insulin is the store-it signal, like a bouncer who keeps escorting fuel into the back room. If the bouncer is on duty 24-7, fat doesn't get many chances to leave. When insulin clocks out more often, stored fuel can finally walk out the door, and your muscles become a better parking garage for glucose. Studies show the shift can be fast. A single bout of resistance exercise can improve glucose control for roughly a day, and research on breaking up long sitting with short walk breaks shows lower post-meal glucose and insulin than just staying planted. In real life, hunger becomes sharper at mealtimes, but less random, and the afternoon crash stops showing up like an unpaid intern demanding snacks. The value this week is simple your energy gets predictable again. If you want a scoreboard, use your post-meal energy and your waistline in the morning. Those usually report the change before the scale writes its review. That's your body proving it can run on steady fuel, not constant snacks. No joke. In weeks one to two, the liver starts getting relief from visceral fats express lane, and this is where many people feel lighter, even if the scale is acting petty. Visceral fat is highly lipolytic when it's stressed, meaning it releases fatty acids readily, and much of that traffic drains toward the liver through portal circulation, so the liver often takes the first hit when visceral fat is overactive. When incoming fat and inflammatory signal noise stay high, the liver stores more fat and keeps pushing glucose into the bloodstream even when you don't need it, like a factory running the night shift for no customer. As those signals calm down, the liver eases off, meals feel less heavy, and cravings stop ambushing you five minutes after you ate. The value here is quiet but huge. Your liver gets to do its job without being bullied.
By weeks two to three, the volume knob on inflammation can start turning down, and consistency stops feeling like a personality test. Fat tissue isn't just storage, it's an endocrine organ that sends messages, and stressed visceral fat tends to broadcast low-grade inflammatory signals that interfere with insulin signaling. Think of it like background apps draining your battery all day. Reviews of obesity-related inflammation often highlight cytokines such as TNF-alpha, IL-6, and IL-1-beta among the usual suspects, while more protective signals like adiponectin tend to run low when metabolic health is worse. As the internal static drops, your body stops acting like everything is an emergency. In real life, sleep feels deeper, soreness doesn't linger as long, mood is less reactive, and appetite stops sending push notifications every hour. The value is freedom. It gets easier to follow the plan because your body is finally cooperating. Between weeks three and six, visceral fat often starts losing the argument in measurable ways, usually around your waist before the scale decides to cooperate. The mechanism is boring on purpose. Repeated, consistent signals create a real weekly energy deficit, and the body has to pull from stored fuel. Visceral fat tends to respond when the pattern is steady, and a 2023 systematic review and meta-analysis in the British Journal of Sports Medicine reported a dose-response pattern where larger weekly deficits generally produced larger reductions in visceral fat, whether the deficit came from eating less, moving more, or both. In real life, belts loosen, sitting feels less compressed, and your abdomen stops negotiating with your ribs. The value is momentum. Progress becomes something you can feel, not just hope for. By months, two to three and beyond, the payoff becomes protection, not just aesthetics, and the science gets blunt about what works. Adherence beats ideology. In the Diabetes Prevention Program, a structured lifestyle program reduced progression to type 2 diabetes by about 58%, and in the Pounds Loss Trial, reduced calorie diets with different macro targets produced broadly similar improvements in abdominal and liver fat. No magical ratio won, consistency did. Clinical guidance also notes that moderate weight loss, often around 5% to 10%, can meaningfully improve metabolic function. The reality check is that crash dieting can wreck sleep, spike stress, and blow up the very habits that make insulin resistance retreat, so keep it repeatable. Fewer liquid calories, fewer late-night second dinners, daily walking, a couple strength sessions, and sleep treated like a priority, not a hobby. The value is the real plot twist. Visceral fat doesn't just shrink, it stops running the show. You don't need a perfect plan to see insulin resistance move in the right direction. You need a plan you can repeat. The scale may lag, but your day-to-day -day cues are easier to track. Fewer crashes after meals, less urgent snacking, and a waist that feels less tight when you sit. Keep it simple. Cut liquid sugar, stop the late second dinner, walk after meals, lift a couple times a week, and protect your sleep. If you have diabetes, fatty liver, heart disease, or you take meds for blood sugar or blood pressure, talk with your clinician before making big changes because improvements can happen and medication doses sometimes need adjustment. Start steady, not extreme. Comment the first change you noticed and I'll tell you what it usually points to, like subscribe and share this with one person who needs it.